lecture on the confusion matrix. We mentioned the way to view various metrics of classification is called the confusion matrix. Let's explore the basics of the confusion matrix to help us understand precision and recall better. In a classification problem, during testing phase, you're going to have two main categories, the true condition and the predicted condition. For example, the true condition of a text message could be that it is spam. The predicted condition is what your machine learning model predicted, such as predicting that that test message was spam. Keep in mind, it could have also predicted it incorrectly as ham. This means if you have two possible classes, you should have four separate groups at the end of testing. You have correctly classified to class one. So that means you had a message that was ham and you positively identified it as ham. There's also correctly classified to class two. So something was truly spam and then you correctly identified it as spam. Then there's the other two options incorrectly classifying something to class one or incorrectly classifying something to class two, a false ham or false spam. So if we were to map these out in a little grid, we'd have something that looks like this. And this is the confusion matrix. And this is the confusion matrix. If you look it up on Wikipedia, which is actually a really helpful article on this, it would map out to something that looks like this. So if we were to actually look at it a little more simplified, for our particular example, going back to those text messages, again, we have the real condition and the predicted condition. So we can see over on the left-hand side that we're gonna have two real conditions. The real condition is either ham or real condition spam. And then along the columns, we have our predicted condition, predicting ham or predicting spam. You'll notice that if the real condition is ham and we predicted ham, then we have a true positive. We correctly predicted that this was positively ham. Along the predicted condition as well, we have a false negative. That means that the real condition was ham, but our machine learning model incorrectly predicted it to be spam. That's a false negative. Here, we're labeling ham as positive and spam as negative. We also see that we have real condition spam and then predicted ham, that's known as a false positive, falsely identifying something to the positive class, which in this case is ham. And we also have finally true negative, correctly identifying something to the negative class predicting spam for a spam text message. Now, if we come back to that other confusion matrix that we saw earlier, we can expand on this to have quite a wide variety of different metrics. We can calculate things like true positive rate, false positive rate, positive likelihood ratio, false omission rate, etc. But really, we're just concerned with a few of these. We're concerned with recall, accuracy, and precision. And here you can see a bunch of formulas for actually calculating those. Now the main point to remember with the confusion matrix and the various calculated metrics is that they are all fundamentally ways of comparing the predicted values versus the true values. And what constitutes good metrics will really depend on the specific situation. In some situations, 99% accuracy is fantastic. In other situations, 99% accuracy may actually not be good enough for whatever you're trying to predict because maybe it comes at the cost of a really poor precision and poor recall. So we can't just say that there's certain good values for particular metrics. Obviously, if you get 100% across precision, accuracy, and recall, if you get across 100% on all three of those, then you have a really good model. But in the real world, you're probably not going to get 100% of all those. So let's go ahead and use a confusion matrix to evaluate our model. Let's imagine now we're testing for disease. So in this example, we're going to test for the presence of a disease and we have the actual patients come in. And remember, this is supervised learning. So before we actually run them through the testing program, we actually already know the true conditions of these patients, whether or not they have the disease or don't have the disease. So you can imagine that we're testing a new diagnostic tool. So in this case, for the example test for presence of disease, we'll say no is equal to a negative test or false. Often you just say that's zero or yes is a positive test, which is true. And again, you say that's one. So in this particular example, the total number of patients we have for this new diagnostic test is 165. So we say N is equal to 165. And then we have the results as follows. Of the condition that people did not have the condition, maybe we're testing for something like a cancer. In this particular example, there's 50 people that didn't have cancer that we correctly predicted they don't have cancer. So we say predicted no, actual no, 50. Then we can also see that we accidentally predicted 
10 people to have the disease, and these people actually did not have the disease. So those 10 were incorrect. Then we also see that we have actual yes and predicted no as 5, and then actual yes and predicted yes as 100. So some basic terminology here are true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. So you can see here on the grid how that actually lines up. And keep in mind, you can kind of flip this, the order of no versus yes on either the columns or the rows in order to flip the quadrants of negatives versus positives. In the original confusion matrix we showed at the beginning of this lecture, that was actually flipped. So keep in mind, you may see the confusion matrix both ways. But other than that, the information presented is still the same. It's just the quadrants are slightly rotated. So if we're trying to answer a question like, what was the accuracy of this test? We ask ourselves, how often is it correct? And for accuracy, it's just equal to true positives plus true negatives divided by the total. Essentially asking the question, how many did I classify correctly over all my examples? And in this case, we get 150 divided by the total number, which was 165. And that means that our test was 91% accurate. Now, is 91% accurate good enough? That really depends on the situation. If you're dealing with something that's as high stakes as something like cancer, 91% accuracy uh, may not be good enough. And you also have to take it into the context of precision and recall. Notice that a really important statistic here is the false negative. The false negative means that you knew this person, when you were going through the test, actually had the disease, but the machine learning model predicted them as not having the disease. That's an extremely dangerous situation to be in when the stakes are very high, like a cancer diagnostic, because that means someone that actually has the disease, you're telling them they do not have it. So you have to keep in context the entire idea of what your machine learning model is trying to achieve. So there's always going to be a bit of a trade-off between false negatives and false positives. And ideally, for something like this, where we're dealing with a really high stakes situation, and we want to make sure we minimize the false negatives. It doesn't matter too much in kind of a diagnostic sense if we have a larger amount of false positives in order to lower our false negatives. Because we would rather set up a situation where we tell a patient that they have a disease when they actually don't have it, and then conclude that they are in line now for further diagnostic tests. Again, it depends on the context of what the next steps are. What we'd really like to avoid in this situation when it comes to disease is telling someone they're clear of the disease when they actually have it. So again, there's no right or wrong answer as far as what your false positive rate or false negative rates should be. It really depends on the context of the situation and how important each of these are in the overall study. Now there's other things you can calculate such as the misclassification rate or error rate. That's another one that's essentially the reverse of accuracy. It's just asking overall how often am I wrong? So that's false positives plus false negatives divided by a total, or 100 minus accuracy. So in this case, we're 9% error rate. Another common thing to keep in mind is that in statistics, false positives and false negatives are often referred to as type 1 errors and type 2 errors. And here we can see kind of a funny example in order to keep in mind the differences between the two. A false positive, here we're telling the man that they're pregnant when clearly this person cannot be pregnant or the false negative, in which case this woman is clearly pregnant, but we're telling them they're not pregnant. So keep in mind, in statistics, you may see type one error and type two error instead of the terms false positives and false negatives. If you're still confused in the confusion matrix, don't worry too much about it. I would encourage you to check out the Wikipedia page for it. It has a really good diagram that we saw during this lecture with all the formulas for all the metrics. Throughout the training, what we're going to be doing is just printing out metrics. For example, we'll just print out accuracy, or print out a confusion matrix, or print out what's known as a classification report, which reports back precision recall and F1 score. Again, it takes time to really get an understanding of these metrics, and more importantly, an intuition behind them. Check out the resource links for this lecture in order to help your understanding of things like precision, recall, and accuracy. All right, coming up next, we're going to discuss a primer into using Python's scikit-learn machine learning library. We'll see you at the next lecture.